All right, Algebra 2. Welcome back, guys. Here we go. We are in Section 4 today. Chapter 11, Section 4, all about compound events. All right? So hopefully you guys have been keeping up, not only with the notes, but with the homework, asking questions. And uh, this is really important that you guys are following along with the phrasing, how they put these problems into words, because they're basically all word problems. There's going to be little, little intricate things that you're looking for, okay? And I know that during class, um, it's not as hard in the homework because a lot of times in the homework, they're going to guide you back to the example problems, which are really helpful, but you have to think ahead on a test. There's not going to be that guiding you back to an example problem type of thing. So if you are heavily like holding on tight to the book giving you directions back to example problems when that gets taken away it will become noticeably harder so let's make sure the notes are there questions are being asked and you guys just keep up with it all right do the best you can repetition more practice and you guys can do it all right so here we go section four uh, let's start with the three definitions. We have a simple, a compound, and a mutually exclusive. A simple event is, I'll zoom in here. All right, a simple event, uh, just as it says, event that just describes a single outcome. So it's just one event, there's a single outcome, boom, it's over. Okay, so there's going to be very few simple events, though, that are occurring. What's really going to happen is you're going to have multiple simple events. All right, so let's get into that because that's a compound event. That's two or more simple events occurring. Could be at the same time, could be at different times. Um, so compound events is a lot of little simple events all occurring, usually together. Now when it gets to be more specific, mutually exclusive events, this is when you're gonna have multiple simple events that can't both occur at the same time or during the same experiment because there's been some qualifications or some some things stated that tell you okay this can happen but not when this happens or this can happen but it can only happen when this other thing happens all right so let's go right here mutually exclusive there's a little symbol right here looks like a U. That symbol right there means that it includes, it is including these things, all right? For two mutually exclusive events, they have to occur um, at, at their same time, okay? Then you have the two mutually exclusive events. We're talking this part right here for A and B. And the phrasing is probability of A with B is the same thing as saying probability of A plus that probability of B. So here's your little example problem. So you have a number cube is rolled, and they're saying what's the probability that it's less than three? Okay, well, you have uh, the number one, you have the number two. What's the probability of getting a one? One out of six. What's the probability of getting a two? One out of six put those together, you have a one-third chance then. So you got to combine those probabilities because they are going together. All right, so mutually exclusive. Um, and that's right here. So you got probability A, probability B. They can occur separate from one another, but they're both going to be happening. Now, inclusive events is one or more outcomes that are in common. Okay, and here's our little picture with that. So that's this upside down U right here. Okay, so we're gonna have an overlap, all right? Inclusive events, there's this overlap portion right here. Um, and a lot of times with that overlap is we're gonna be pulling that overlap out. So they might be looking for just this value or just this value. But the overlap means that it goes with both examples or both events, and we're going to take those out. So that means that we didn't want the event that occurred in both worlds. We just wanted this one 
or this one. Okay, so that kind of covers a little bit of compound events, whether they're simple, none of these are really simple, but they're gonna take a simple event and then use it either exclusive, so it's like this event can occur, separately this event can occur, or inclusive, where we zoom back in here and we're saying that, all right, the first event could occur right over here, the second event that could occur, yes, but there will be an overlap, meaning you could actually have this event occur and it fits in both worlds. Meaning in this both worlds, we wanted even numbers, the prime numbers, but the number two, that's both even and prime. So usually we're gonna take that event out because we only want one or the other. All right, so let's get into some more phrases here for inclusive events. Uh, look at this example here. When you roll a number cube, again, uh, six sides, numbers one through six, probability, even number, or prime. And this was the example given right here, even number or prime. Okay, so even number, there's a three out of six chance. A prime number, there's a three out of six chance. But the one event, getting the number two, which is even and prime, there's a one out of six chance. That's why we're gonna subtract it. We wanna take that out because we don't want that occurring because look at the phrasing here, even number or prime number. We don't want that phrasing to be even number and prime because in that case, it is only a one out of six chance, but that's not the phrasing. That's why these words are so important. It says or prime. So keep up with what you're actually reading here. The words mean a lot. All right. Uh, probability of inclusive. There's a couple example problems. All right, rolling a five or an odd number, that key word there. So five or an odd number. Well, probability of a five, one and six. Probability of odd, three and six. But notice five is an odd number. So we gotta take that one and six, take it out, and you're just looking at basically a three over six that's left reduced to one half. Okay, let's look at a second example. Rolling, here's another key phrase, at least one four when rolling two dice. All right, probability of getting a four, one and six. Probability of getting another four, one and six. Probability though, of rolling both four and another four. There's only one time where the dice can do that out of a total, remember, of 36 different uh, combinations for two dice. So that one over 36 is if you roll the dice and both came up as fours, we didn't want that. All right, so we take that one and 36 out and then there's your final solution there. Okay. This one, I will admit, I, I'm not really going to walk you through it, but this is a really helpful example problem. Okay, this example problem right here, um, it's going to be helpful in terms of what if we have an overlap and what if we want to take the overlap out. We'll do another example problem uh, really soon here that does cover something similar to that. But this is just giving you more example problems to take a look at, okay? The more the better. All right, let's go. Example problems, here we are. First one, um, give ourselves a little bit of space here. Okay, so each student can cast one vote. Listen to the phrasing there. Each student can cast one vote. That's important to log away. All right, they're voting for senior class president. Of the students, we have 25% for Hunt, 20% for Klein, 55% for Vila. And let's move into our first question. All right. Oh, although a student from the senior class is selected at random. All right, random, that's another key phrase there. Okay, explain why the events, either voting for Hunt or voting for Klein or voting for Vila are mutually exclusive. They are mutually exclusive. Let's get our answer written over here. 
because you can only cast your vote once. All right. Only cast vote once. Because you can only cast your vote once, that's it. You cast your vote for Hunt, you're done. You cannot go back and vote for the other two. So it is mutually exclusive, meaning there's different events all occurring at the same time, but these events can't happen over one another. Like you can't get all three votes at once. So people are voting all at once, yes, and they are voting at random, yes, but when you cast your vote, it is for only one candidate only, so that's why it's mutually exclusive. You're exclusively voting for this one person, and that's it. So that's why that goes in the category of mutually exclusive. All right, next one, probability that a student voted for Klein or Vila. So here's our number breakdowns. Klein got 20%. Vila got 55%. Remember that it is either a vote for Vila or a vote for Klein. And this is actually simply a put the numbers together. If you add these up, you are still getting 100% of the votes. So, and what I mean by that is if you add up all three candidates, they add up to 100%. So Vila and Klein put together make 75% of the vote. So that's the probability that a student voted for each. It works out really nice because our total is still 100%. So good, good. All right, let's move on to example two. Remember that in a deck of cards, you have 52 cards. If they don't ever specify that, go with that as a given, 52 total cards. All right, card drawn from a deck of 52, find the probability of each. Okay, we are drawing a king or a heart. All right, let's work this problem out right over here. Okay, so a king, how many kings are there in a deck of cards? There are four kings in a total deck of cards. Now, some of you guys may be saying, how am I supposed to know that? You need to learn a little bit, unfortunately, about cards here. Okay, so, and if you haven't learned a lot about cards, uh, just a quick breakdown here. All right, there are four suits, all right? You have um, diamonds, you have hearts. Diamonds and hearts, those are red suits. And then you have spades and you have clubs, and those are black suits, all right? You have, uh, let's see, uh, Jack, King, Queen are face cards, and then you have two through 10 are regular numbered cards. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's just a quick breakdown there for you. So uh, we will have questions and probabilities with cards. So let's get back to it. All right, drawing a king was four out of 52 or a heart. All right, and there are 13 total cards per suit. Okay, 13 total cards per suit. That would be, that means there are 13 hearts over a total of 52 cards. Now, isn't there a king of hearts? That is true. So that means that we have to subtract one over 52 because there is a king of hearts. And the phrasing used here, if we could see, is the word or. All right, the word or meaning we don't want and. It's the word or. We want a heart or we want a king. So when we work out the math on that with the fraction, let's see, that's gonna get us reduced, by the way, is four over 13. Now, if you were to plug this into the calculator, odds are it's gonna give you a decimal. Don't forget the little trick where you can push the math button and then convert decimals to fractions because that's really helpful in this chapter you're going to want a lot of conversions from decimals back to fractions. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the second one, 2B. We're going to do this one down here. 
All right, so drawing a red card, hearts or diamonds. Remember that, drawing a red card, hearts or diamonds. Or, there's that word again, or, so remember that, a face card, jack, queen, or king. All right, and notice they didn't specify a suit on that, just a jack, queen, or king, but we have four suits. All right, so let's get this one set up. They said a red card, hearts or diamonds. Remember that we have 13 total cards per suit. So 13 hearts, 13 diamonds, 26 out of 52 would be for the hearts and diamonds. Then they're saying a jack, queen, or king. That's for all four suits though. So there's three face cards, there's four suits. So we're looking at 12 possible face cards, again, out of 52 total cards. Then we need to subtract here because what if we had a jack, queen, or king of hearts? There's three of them. Another jack, queen, or king of diamonds. There's three more. That's a total of six overlapping cards that we don't want to get. That's our subtraction for the fraction. And then work out all the fractions, get all your decimal, reduce it down, and you're going to get 8 over 13. Now, again, guys, I'm not writing out the decimals. I've worked all these out and then converted the decimals already. You need to make sure that you're confident doing that. If you're just straight copying this down and not understanding that you actually have to do this math right here to get to that solution, it's going to be a rough go. You have to be able to do that. That's the calculator, but if you're not confident with it, practice, practice, practice. All right, so that's our solution right here. Let's not forget our solution that was up there. Okay. And again, if any of this is confusing, rewatch it. Go back, rewatch it. Okay, number three here. This one's going to take a little bit of space. Okay. So, of 160 beauty spa customers, we have 96 had hairstyling, 61 had a manicure, 28 customers who had only a manicure. That's important because that means they're setting us up for an overlap, okay? And then we want the probability that a customer had a hairstyling or a manicure. All right, again, the word or. Okay, let's set this up so you can see exactly what we're talking about here. We had 96 for hair. We had 61 for the mani. All right, manicure there. And let's have a little bit of a breakdown. Off of that 61, 28 only had the manicure. Okay. Now, what is the difference? 61 to 28, there is a difference of 33. That tells you that 33 customers actually had both a manicure and a hairstyling. So we have to connect the 96 with the 33 as well because you had two options, hair, manicure. You could do both or you could do one or the other. 28 only manicure, 61 total manicure, because 33 did both. That means that there's uh, 63 that were only hair. All right? That is how you want to start, is gather all your info and break this down. Okay? There's 160 total customers. All right? But if you take 61 and 96, that's not going to get you to that perfect number of 160. So right off the bat, you know there is an overlap. 
Some customers did both and they're counting the both in the total for 96 hair and 61 manicure. So what we need to take here is now add these three pieces up and that's going to equal 124. All right, 124 because that both number skews everything. All right, so 63, 33, 28, 124. Now let's go back. Probability that a customer had a hairstyling or a manicure. Now we need, let's see, 124 over 160, All right? That was the customers that got and then total customers, all right? Um, all right, reduce the fraction, reduce, reduce, reduce always. Again, it'll get down to a decimal. I believe we get a fraction of 31 over 40. Okay, so that's key, the breakdown. The breakdown is how you start these problems here. All right, you gotta make sure gather all the info that they tell you and then start to look closely. They gave us some important info by saying that 28 only got the manicure. So that's a clue right there saying that some got both and you need to figure out what that number is because then once you figured out that 33 got both, you can pull that out of the 96 for the hair. Okay. All right, let's move into our last example problem here. This is a biggie. Um, all right, so in one day, five different customers bought earrings from the same jewelry store. Let's pull out what we know. Five different people, one jewelry store, same jewelry store. Okay, store offers 62 different styles, lots of different styles. All right, we're looking to find the probability that at least, this is important, at least two customers bought the same style. Out of 62 different styles, what's the probability at least two customers? Remember that there are how many? Just a total of five different customers. So this probability is not going to be very high, okay? This is going to be one where we're going to use what's called the complement. All right. If you look back in section two, I believe that is where, yeah, section two, you're going to find information that we covered um, that's called the complement. That's like the other side of it. So if you're talking about wanting two of them and there was a total of 10, then the complement is the eight. It's the leftovers. It's what the other option could have been. All right, so let's get this set up here. Um, okay, now when we jump into this, the first thing to figure out also is, is this a permutation or a combination? And I'll tell you, it's not the easiest thing in the world when you're doing these types of problems to really pull this out but the key thing that I focused in on right at the end is that same style matters. Same style means that there is an order to this. And if order matters, we're dealing with a permutation, a permutation. All right. Now, what are the different values we got to plug in? Well, 62 combos or different styles, sorry, 62 different styles five different customers. Now here's where the complement comes in. We're gonna be taking a look at the complement, which is now gonna say one minus the permutation of 62 and five, because we wanna figure out the other side of what is left. That's the at least two customers. Now, what are we going to divide this by? We're going to divide this by 62 to the power 
of five. And actually my division line is a little too long there, just that part of it. All right, if you wanna take a look at example four in the textbook, this is helpful, it connects to this example that we are doing now. Okay, now the calculator is vital here. It's very helpful, very important. When you're working out permutations, you're gonna to wanna to push that math button, probability. And this is repetition and practice, practice, practice. Okay, so the phrasing at least, when they throw that up there, this is where you should clue in to knowing I have to use the complement to figure out the other side of what's left. All right, we don't want the permutation of all, we just want the permutation of at least two. Okay, could be more, but at least two. Now, when you work out all of this math here, you plug it into the calculator, I'm gonna give you the numbers, but I'm telling you, that it's a lot easier than you're gonna see because the numbers, uh, it, it makes it, <laughs> it makes it a little more overwhelming. So when you work out the permutation of 65, or sorry, 62 and five, this is what you should get on top and then 62 to the fifth power. This is what you're gonna get on the bottom. Okay, work all of this out. And then it is going to reduce down to 0 0.1524. All right, so ultimately that is our final solution right here. But the key thing is the phrasing, at least two customers. So that at least two customers part means you have to use the complement. And the complement is what's the other chunk. We don't want just all five, we want at least two of the five. And that's where the one minus comes into play and the 62 to the fifth power comes into play. All right, 62 to the fifth, you know, 62, 62, 62, all right, five times. That's again for like all five customers, but we don't want all five. We wanna to try to take away from that. There's the one minus. All right, guys, so that covers us for section four, example problem four, example problems one through three, okay? Bring your questions to class. Keep up with these notes and pay close attention to the phrases and the words. Oh, and of course, I, I can't forget here, uh, the random question that I'm gonna throw in at the end of these excessively long note videos. My apologies for that. Um, let's see here. I want you guys to try and find what is the most venomous snake in the world? There you go. All right. I will see you guys in the next video.